Now, the rise of sharecropping led to real radical changes in southern, uh, southern life and in the rural areas in some ways. This is in my book, but it's a very, very famous image of the Barrow Plantation in Georgia before and after the Civil War. Okay, on the left, Barrow Plantation before the Civil War, on the right, 1880 or something like that. Before the Civil War, the slaves are all living in one little community at the center. There's the sort of big house up here, and then there's the slave community. They're all living in slave cabins in one little centralized place of the plantation. Look at what it looks like in 1880. They are scattered. These families are now scattered over the length of, and breadth of the plantation. Each family has its own little plot of land, which it is, uh, which it is tilling. The slave community has been broken up into these family farms. They're all pretty close to each other. They're not totally isolated, but they are separate. They're more separated out than they were during the um, slavery days. And you can't see it on here, but there is a school there now on the plantation, which you wouldn't have had. <laughs> and there's a church. for the, They've also built their own church. If you, look, if you look in the book, you'll see they're on there with a little label. So this is... This shows you how the, just the physical setup of community has changed because of the uh, rise of sharecropping, uh, of sharecropping here. Now, by the way, sharecropping on the face of it is not an unreasonable arrangement given the existence of a large group of landless laborers and a group of people owning the land but without much cash and needing labor. Um, but what makes it pernicious is its connection to the credit system of the South, what we call the crop lien, L-I-E-N, crop lien, not lean in like what's the name, lien, the crop lien. What is a lien? The lien is, is a debt, or that is to say is a claim. Someone puts a lien. If you owe someone money, they can put a lien on your property in order to make sure they get paid, right? So if you own a house, but uh, you buy your credit card bills are going too, far, too high and you can't pay them, the bank may put a lien on your house. To, oh, by the way, the government does this. The IRS is always putting liens on people's property to get their money. So the, the, now, the farmers always need credit, right? By definition, they don't get their money until the end of the year, right? They get, the crop is harvested, they sell it, they get their money. But how are they going to live through the year? they have to borrow money. Farmers are always borrowing money. In the North, they borrow it. What's the, you need collateral, right? You gotta, what are you promising the guy you're loan, borrowing this money from? In the North and the West, the basic collateral is the land, right? A mortgage. A farmer takes out a loan from the bank with his land as the collateral. And if he can't pay, as sometimes happens, the bank will seize his land. But in the South, land has dropped in value enormously. And moreover, there are no banks. They're all bust from the war. The people with money are merchants, local merchants. They're the ones who you borrow money from. What do they want? They don't want your land. They want the crop. They want that cotton crop. That's the most valuable thing in the South is cotton after the war because the price is still pretty high. So this is what they call the crop lien. In order to get money, in order to borrow money, you've got to pledge your, a share of your future crop. That's why this business of who gets it first is the, the planter is borrowing money with the crop as his collateral. The farmer, the sharecropper, is going to a merchant, borrowing money. He needs equipment. He needs food for his family. He needs seed or whatever it is, clothing. What is he pledging? His share of the crop. Um, it's these country stores where the credit system is centered. Here's a very rare photo of a country store in the south. This is a rural area. There's a bridge going over a stream. And this is a country store out in the left. The south is full of these little stores scattered around the countryside, run by merchants who are loaning money to planters and sharecroppers. They're getting their money from the north. 
That's where the money is. They're, they're getting credit from the North and they're distributing it around and they get a, they're, 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 they're pledged a share of the crop as collateral. So what is the result of this? Um, first of all, it means you've got to grow cotton, right? You've got to grow cotton. You go to the merchant and say, hey, I'd like to borrow some money. I'm growing some food for my family. They say, no, we're not interested in that. We're not giving you any money on the basis of some cabbage or something. No. You grow cotton, I'll loan you the money. You, lo you, you grow anything else, forget it. This means that unlike other places that abolished slavery, cotton production in the South, by the 1870s, is back to its pre-war level. Back to its pre-war level. In the West Indies, sugar production fell dramatically after the end of slavery. Coffee production fell after the end of slavery. But in the U.S., cotton revives, partly because there's a high price in the market, and mostly, though, because of this crop lien. The credit system is pushing people to grow cotton whether they want to or not. So, as I say, more cotton, more cotton. Well, what's the result of that? What, what happens if there's more and more cotton being grown? The price of cotton keeps falling. For 30 years after the Civil War, the price of cotton descends. Overproduction of cotton, not only in the South, but around the world. So it becomes harder and harder to make ends meet if you're growing cotton, right? Um, by the 1930s, in the Great Depression, the New Deal will devise a plan to pay people not to grow cotton. The only way to bolster up the price is to reduce the amount grown. But no single person can do that. If I'm a small farmer, I say, well, I'm, gonna, I'm not growing cotton. It's going to push up the price. No, that, there's no effect. You've got to get everyone to do that. You've got to get everyone to stop growing cotton or to reduce cotton if you want to affect the price. Only the government can do that. Individual choice is not going to affect that, um, the price of cotton. So the crop lien system pushes the South even further into this one crop mold, which is a disaster for economic growth long, long after the end of Reconstruction. Here's an important point, therefore. Land is not the only scarce resource. If African Americans had been given 40 acres and a mule, they would have been better off, but they still would have been entrapped by this credit system. Credit is just as important to a farmer as land. And the credit system which existed was terribly deleterious to white farmers as well as black.